What is the meaning behind the headless depictions of man in antiquity? Such imagery follows an archetypal narrative that is to be found, reducing the individual to the collective and instinctual urges of bodily experience and existence. The head, or anything above the neck, is often symbolic of the ego, the I in identity. A portion, which often at times is the primary place in which one's personality and identity is born, through the conceptual, illustrative and ethical place of the mind, as opposed to that of what the body can produce and create. For example, in the gory appearance of the self-decapitating goddess Sinamasta, from the Hindu pantheon, we see a strong illustration of that which is the opposite of the ego and rather the raw materials of nature's feminine collective existence. Blood, death and sex, all a symbol housing the complete rotation of the life force which is libidinal energy. All a symbol of the instincts and that of the collective force in which all of man is born into through this world what Freud would have called the id, existent in all forms of life, thus being the opposite of the individual or ego and identity. We can use the depiction of the head and body to understand the differences of, let's say, the right and left hand paths in esoteric religious circles, as Madame Blavatsky would have called it. For example, Abrahamic religions such as Judaism, Christianity and Islam all follow a specific moral code that tend to debase, if you will, the spiritual aspects of the body and instincts, and use conceptual cosmological ideas to lay down a metaphysical basis to their religious laws. As we can see, this is all very heady, conceptual and metaphysical, whereby what is enlightened is the rational mind that aims towards heaven, if you will. While on the other hand, the left-hand path questions moral dogmas to embrace a form of spiritual anarchism, an attempt to search for spiritual freedom by embracing all aspects of body and rejecting social taboos. Thus, sexuality can often be embraced into magical ritual. This can be identified through the term of Vamashara, meaning the left-hand way in Sanskrit from Indian Tantric practice which emphasised the breaking of societal Hindu taboos at the time by having, for example, sexual intercourse at ritual, drinking alcohol and eating meat in assemblies at graveyards. The left and right dynamic in religion and spirituality has existed for a very long time. The early Christian tradition would, for example, bury the dead facing eastward, towards the rising sun, while deviant burials were often buried in the opposite direction of the west where the sun does not rise. But the specific Greek term akaphalioi means the headless man, and these mythical creatures in Greek myth were rumoured to exist in antiquity where they would inhabit remote parts of the world including places like ancient Libya and Africa. It is said that they used to be an ordinary race of people that had a terrible encounter and disagreement with the gods causing them to have their heads severed off forever. Either way, the headless depictions of spiritual and mythological antiquity depict the differences founded within the spiritual paths of life. The Dionysian and the Apollonian or even the headless rite performed in ceremonial magic with the intent of placing the magician above the forces of nature by identifying with divine forces. Or in more modern times, the mimetic dynamic of Chad and Incel, which is another form of modern reincarnation of previous depictions, if you like. The headless Akafelioi, who doesn't use one's head but lives within the undergrowth of the land, in which he hunts and lives through the body without the need of intellectual thought to survive and live a good life the esoteric Chad, if you will. Thus, the public review and secret society of Asafel used the same term in which Greeks used to depict these mythical creatures of headless man. Formulated by the French philosopher Georges Bataille, 
an interesting contemporary writer who explored the topics of eroticism and mysticism, the public review of Asafel would find many interests in the subject of Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophical works. This is made most obvious when looking at the art produced for the society and public review, which in my mind symbolises the purest depiction of Dionysian affirmation. As this was during around the time and rise of fascism in World War II, it was of both great maddening for the group to find that Nietzsche's sister would not only contort many aspects of her brother's philosophy into Nazi propaganda, but also for her to become a romantic towards the twisted fascist ideology, to then marry a notorious leader who worked in many political anti-Semitic circles in Germany. Not much is known about what the actual secret society got up to in their day, but what is known is that the members of the secret society had to follow a particular set of rituals, such as participating in nocturnal meetings in the woods around beside an oak tree which had been struck by lightning, refusing to shake hands with anti-Semites, to celebrate the decapitation of Louis XVI, to participate in meditation at assemblies on the works of Nietzsche, Freud and Said, members of the society even discussed and talked about taking part in a human sacrifice for the sake of psychological preparedness for the violence and loss that would be to come during Nazi occupation in France, but this was never carried out. The anti-fascist doctrine of this secret society highlights the principle of Dionysus from Greek mythology in which they so reveled. The Nietzschean philosophy of life through physiology and being acceptant of one's material urges and bodily existence per se, whereby fascism and all ideology for any matter are simply the becomings of that which gets conceptualised, made up and created within the minds of man to then, in their utmost harmful of cases, be perpetrated unto the thousands and millions through the likes of something like anti-semitism, whereby the psychology of such madness in creation can only become understood through maybe psychoanalysts or Freud, which is probably why they also meditated on such works. As of today, a similar conception of life is seen and is the cause for why many have found such value in the works of Nietzsche, and thus the case for the growing philosophical think tank against, you could say, the anti-life existence for digital displacement, the draining power of one's own libidinal surge from the ever-widening and encapsulating internet, that which ultimately demands the grand summation of everyone's creative potential with how it intervenes in every miniature aspect of life.